morning. It's Wednesday, uh, about the 5th of December. I'm just walking Phoebe. I'm just thinking about epistemic objects, thinking with stuff. I haven't had to think about this actually because I've, I signed myself up a few months ago to do a, a what they call a research bite at work, which just means we sit down together at lunchtime and uh, talk about the things we're interested in. You know, it's a kind of a salon, you know, and those kind of things. But um, I volunteered to do one a few months ago, as I say. When, uh, when I was asked for a title, I said, oh, well, I'm quite interested in epistemic objects, epistemic actions. So I put forward this title I wanted to talk about, epistemic actions, Oops. thinking with stuff. And I've been so busy, to be honest with you, I haven't had a lot of time to think about what I'm going to think about in order to talk about this thing today. So I'm just going to use this opportunity to <laughs> rehearse those ideas. I mean, basically, uh, what I thought I'd do is um, talk a little bit about well, I thought I'd show a couple of YouTube videos first off to some of my colleagues at work. Some of them know about them already, but some don't. Probably the um, probably one of the cliff edge ones. Maybe the most recent one where I throw a pair of pants off the cliff, and then maybe that one where I'm walking on drawing pins because they're quite short. You know, I don't spend a lot of time on that. Just show those, just to give people a sense of what I'm doing. But also maybe say, give them a bit of context that most of my videos aren't like that. Most of them are like this. You know, just walk and talk videos where I ramble aimlessly to a camera about whatever's going through my head at the time whilst walking the dog. Uh, and then go on to talk about the fact that, you know, the visible parts of what I'm doing, the visible parts of my practice, let's call it, this thinking thing, are these videos. You know, that's, that's, that's what people see, isn't it? And to the extent that these walk and talk videos are kind of ruminations, people see that. But they also see those... As I say, the, the videos like the drawing pins one or the throwing pants off the cliff one, which kind of look like um, artworks, I guess, or they look like end products, they look like stuff, you know, um, I think. But there's a lot of other stuff that I do and that I know you do and other people do, which, are, which isn't so obvious. You know, I spend a lot of my time writing, for example. I write, I, I get up really early, about past four or five o'clock. And, I've, and I usually write something really early on, so I usually write about a thousand words in the morning before six o'clock. I do a lot of that kind of stuff. And I also fiddle around with objects and fiddle around with pieces of paper and bits of clay and plasticine, Play-Doh, pieces of wood. You know, I make things. Just, just not, not, I don't usually display them, but I do fiddle around with those kind of things. And I've got quite a bunch of them at home. And what I'll probably do is take them into work today, actually, and show people one or two of them. I mean, they're crap, you know, but who knows? Maybe I'll be interested. And, I'm, and I've been trying to think in my head, what is the status of these objects? Because these objects, these things I'm making, these tweaks of plasticine and stuff, they're, um, they're kind of related to everything else I'm thinking about. They kind of relate to this video I'm making now, and all these walking talks, and the ideas that I try to think into in these walking processes. And they kind of relate also to the videos that look more like outcomes, you know, the the, uh, the drawing pins and the pants videos and that kind of stuff. Um, so what is the relationship between these little actions, these objects, me sitting at my kitchen table fiddling with plasticine and the rest of the stuff, the more visible stuff? And what I want to do is I want to think about it in terms of these things called epistemic actions, which is a term that's from, uh, I've talked about it before I think, it's from Maglio and Kirsch, two researchers a few years ago, who were looking at people who played uh, Tetris, you know, the video game, and also chess players. And now what people do when they play Tetris, as the blocks are coming down from the top, people tweak them so that they rotate them on the way down. Uh, because it makes you play better, you know, you, you're more successful in terms of getting the blocks optimally stacked to the bottom, if you do this thing, moving them around. But what is the function of that? What's the status of these actions? And what Maglio and Kirsch suggest is that these are what they call epistemic actions. They're not instrumental, they don't, they don't have an instrumental function, they don't do anything practically in the game itself. But they do have a function, epistemically, in the terms of thought. They help you think better. They help you think about where to put the block. And similarly with chess, particularly novice chess players apparently, like me, that, that uh, if you're playing the game, uh, you typically you'll pick up a piece and you'll move it to where you think you might want to put it and then look at the board, see what it looks like with the piece held on that place. You won't let go of it, of course, because that's a commitment, isn't it? But for some reason, just moving the piece there, even though it doesn't do anything instrumentally, practically, 
it just helps you think about that. And again, what Maglion Kerr says is that that's an epistemic action. It's not an instrumental, it's epistemic. It helps the thought process. And so what they say is that that's a kind of outsourcing, kind of outsourcing of thinking, what we think of as cognitive processes, out onto the world. Because when we think about thinking, so they say, when we talk about it, we imagine it's an entirely neuronal process, that thinking is what happens between the neurons and the brain, and this thinking is in relation to something which is out there in the world, separate from it. But what they're saying is, that, no, that's, a, that's, that's not a healthy way of thinking about thinking. And in a sense, it's an arbitrary way of, that, of, of drawing boundaries about what constitutes a thought. So it's much more interesting and useful to think about, to consider thinking, as yes, it involves neuronal processes, but it also involves the world that you're working with. So when the Tetris players are thinking, cognitively engaged with the action of trying to stack these blocks in the most optimal manner, that thinking also includes their thumbs, it includes the muscles in their arms, it includes their eyes, it includes the photons that are flying off the screen and hitting their retinas, telling them where the blocks are. It involves the programming in the computer. All this is part of that thinking process. And I don't mean that, and they certainly don't mean that in any kind of metaphysical way. They're not suggesting that there's a kind of strange loop of cognitive, I don't know, some kind of power emitted from the brain. No, it's just that that word thinking itself is better applied to all of the all of the uh, aspects of the physical world and the energetic world that it encounters, not just the bits that happen to be defined by terms like neuron. Because when you do that, if you say, "Well, thinking is just what happens in the brain," you're making an artificial cutoff point, because there isn't a, a, a distinct cutoff point. You know, the, the the eye that's looking at the Tetris screen has also got uh, neurons in its retina. You know, so it's so is the eye part of that, and the uh, all the various processes that are happening within the eye, within the uh, what's it called, that jelly-like stuff in your eye. I mean, all those things are involved, and what the, what the lens is doing is involved, and what the light beams are doing, it's all involved. You know, so to artificially cut it off and say it's the brain doesn't really capture it. Really, it's, it's arbitrary. Uh, so as I say, thinking in Maglion Kirsch and others, people like Max Vellmans who talks about it, what's the word he uses, um, neural monism he calls it, to get away from the kind of dualism of the thing that's doing a thinking and the thing that's thought about. And Max Vellmans calls it neural monism which is this, uh, again, this kind of loop of thought which in catch, in embraces both the, the brain that's involved and the object of that, what we traditionally think of as the object of that thought and the, and the material means of engaging with that object. It's all part of this thing called thinking. Which I really like. I mean, I like all those ideas, epistemic actions, epistemic objects. And I've, I've, I've just came up with the term epistemic objects, well, I imagine other people have used it before. Which is just a name that, you know, you might give to something that's part of that outsourcing process. You know, because other researchers, I think Maglo and Kirsch also, but other researchers have suggested that that model of, of uh, outsourcing cognitive processes onto the world it's something we do all the time, you know, every time you write something down on a piece of paper, you're effectively outsourcing memory onto the environment, aren't you? Um, every time you count on your fingers, you're outsourcing your kind of calculation algorithms into, onto the environment, and so on, you know. So, um, and these things are, in many cases, objects. A piece of paper with writing on it is an object. So these are like epistemic objects, objects which contain this process called thinking. They're not necessarily outcomes of that thought, they're not the finished product of that thought, separate from the thought itself. They're within the loop of thought that embraces both the thinker and the thought. Uh, and, and, you know, revealing that distinction is somewhat arbitrary, really. So, so cut to the chase. The, um, what I'm thinking of now, what I'm imagining, is these objects that I'm making, these little clay figures and these little loops of paper and just stuff that I can fiddle with whilst I'm thinking, are also a part of that. They're part of the... Um, the epistemic object um, manifestations of that really. They're part of the thinking outsourced onto the environment. Uh, and some of the actions. You know, I'd be hard pressed to exactly say what part of thinking, uh, me dressed in, a, in rabbit ears throwing my pants off a cliff, exactly what part of thinking that constitutes. But I can kind of feel that it is in the same way that the clay objects are, or walking across, across drawing pins. Again, I'd be hard pressed to say exactly what. Uh, you know, what part of that outsourced thought that constitutes, which is something I may want to think about in the future. 
but I can, I can kind of sense that it is, you know. It's not an outcome in the sense that it's uh, a product different from the process of its manufacturing. It's, um, it's part of the same epistemic activity, part of the same epistemic sequence of objects and actions and activities and engagements. Anyway, that's what I'm up to. I'm knackered now, my arm hurts. Yeah, but I get back. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today in this research bites lunch thing. Epistemic actions and this thinking with stuff. I don't know if it makes any sense. I'll try and get it more cogent before 12 o'clock. Hey, Phoebs. Bye.